Chapter 12, 100 Years of Grerers. The theoretical development of masculine liking masculine is modern, but not completely new. In the recent past, many have reached similar conclusions to Grero. For this, we are indebted to them, while it would behoove us to learn for, from the reasons of their failures. Geiman, uh, Gemeinschef der Eigenen and der Eigenen. The prevalent view of so-called homosexuality in the early 20th century Germany mirrors today's two gay dogmas. Men attracted to members of their own sex constitute not just a small, min uh, not just a small but also gender-shifted minority. A group calling itself the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen, or GDE, translated as the Community of Self-Owners, critique these conventional views, echoing much of Grero and their refutations. There is no group past or present that has come so uh, that has come so close to articulating the Grero point of view. They are nothing short of our ideological predecessors. We miss the Greeks and Romans by almost two millennia. We miss our German colleagues by less than a century. Our knowledge about the thoughts of the members of the GDE, at least in the English language, comes from a single book of translated excerpts from Der Eigene, a magazine founded by Adolf Brand in 1896 and named for the seminal work of the individualist anarchist Max Stirner. Brand billed the magazine as a journal for male culture, art, and literature, and it served to satisfy a, quote, thirst for a revival of Greek times and Hellenic standards of beauty after centuries of Christian barbarism, end quote. Adolf Brand led a colorful life as an activist. He was the first person to out hypocritical politicians and assaulted such a member of the Reichstag with a dog whip. Despite prison sentences under both Imperial Germany and the Weimar Republic, his activism was only extinguished after the Nazi takeover of Germany and subsequent banning and confiscation of Reagan. He and his wife died during the Allied bombing of Germany in the waning months of World War II in 1945. Whereas we have the word Grero, the GDE described much of the same concept using two different words. Now to the uh, quote, now to the meaning of Lieblegmine. I point out that this word is a new coinage of mine. I had to find a word that, until now, had not been dirtied in the mouths of people. I selected a double title as, so as to indicate by Freundesliebe, love of friends, that in this collection is as much that is less consciously characteristic of Mine, chivalric love, much in which this feeling perhaps unconsciously pulses under the surface." End quote. Like us, they drew inspiration from the Greeks and Romans. They also understood that exclusive heterosexuality repressed a genuine masculinity. Quote, when man entered into the almost, almost exclusive service of women and her taste, he lost his masculinity and retained only a sham dominion. Woman has gained personal rights for herself, also legally. Good, for, good. Let, let her have them, uh, as far as her personal strengths reach. But it is also time that man think about himself and, we need an emancipation of man for the revival of a manly culture. And this is, is uh, and it is this that I'm advocating here, end quote. Of course, if a genuine masculinity includes love of other men, then culture must be the culprit for the lack of same-sex desires. Quote, Allegedly, a man can only have sexual feelings for a woman and a woman for a man. The individual person from the beginning on has feelings to a certain extent for persons of the same and of the other sex. Mostly through public prejudices, one feeling is reduced to traces. Situational, homo uh, end quote. Situational homosexuality, or pseudo-homosexuality, was critiqued by the scientist Benedict Friedlander. Quote, Recently, the most productive of the medical doctors who have been writing about things sexual have wanted to separate Hellenic pederasty, sanctified by national custom, as a pseudo-homosexuality connected with bisexuality uh, from genuine homosexuality. That this national custom was based in much higher degree of bisexuality than our pure homosexuality is correct, of course, as has been said, and this was long ago emphasized by us and others. But since it is still a matter of true love among those truly of the same sex, it is simply incomprehensible what should be pseudo about it." End quote. Adolf Brand understood the purpose of indoctrinating young men against the same-sex attractions via criminal statues or insinuations of effeminacy as a way to decrease the incidence of such attractions. Quote, 
All opponents of our movements are, are still seeking today to be guardian of the male youth and to convince them that friend love is a vice or a crime that, that, and that intimate relations with a friend or a, are at least unmanly so as to keep them away from cultivating such relations, end quote. The obviousness of a sexually ready youth being sexual being sexual was acknowledged, quote, I hold the close relationship of man to man, of man to youth, and youth to youth to be a strong element of the state and of culture, end quote. And not just acknowledged, but even recommended it as a public duty, quote, all should finally know that natural and moderate sexual satisfaction of young lads and men among themselves is no sin, but rather a clever outlet of nature in the time of puberty, which is a transition to a genuine sexual intercourse, and which one may rationally neither hinder nor suppress, as the insanity of the medical charlatans and sanctimoniousness of our current Reichstag demands. One should rather give this clever self-help of nature imag uh, imaginable help and consideration and carefully guard against disturbing the sacred charm of such harmless joys of life through senseless prohibitions and interferences. Indeed, one should even follow the goal of regarding the general cultivation of such intimates services of friendship as a matter of public welfare and make the close joining to a friend a self-evident duty of every young man." End quote. Moderation was not just a slogan. Quote, what is actually actually to be punished then? Absolutely every intercourse of a man with a boy under 14 years. End quote. Their hope was was uh, their hope was that after laws were overturned, public opinion would soon change, allowing a blossoming of previously suppressed same-sex attractions. Quote. The opponents of the repeal of paragraph 175 have also already based their standpoint on the indication that, after the repeal, the number of homosexuals would increase. They are not entirely incorrect. To be sure, the repeal in and of itself would not change the situation very much. But when public opinion recognizes our love as having equal rights, when an arising new culture has again established the basis of aesthetic feeling, then surely thousands will reflect on themselves and also bring to development their homosexual dreams drive, which in addition to the normal one, was asleep in them, and which our contemporary culture has suppressed and destroyed with a hundred thousand influences." End quote. Again, this change in attitude was premised on the idea of innate but suppressed sexual flexibility among most men. Quote, the GDE stand on the point of view of a bisexual tendency of all people which he inherited, which we inherited from father and mother, and which is the primary form of all varieties of love. The GDE is convinced that only this bisexual tendency of all people and its recognition in every individual can yield the new powerful foundation on which mutual understanding and sexual question is still possible at all, and on which alone the fight for equal rights of love of friends in addition to woman love can lead to victory. End quote. And, quote, but a homosexual feeling is found along with the heterosexual in almost every person. End quote. Their only flaw was not uh, was to not call out that the category homosexual itself creates the conflation of effeminate types and those we can now describe as grero. As homosexuality arises out of a focus on procreation, it is irredeemably tainted and should not be used. On November 29, 1933, Adolf Brand sent a letter complaining of the Nazi seizure and ban of his material. Lady, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, as an honorary member of your society, I feel obligated to give you a detailed report on the utter futility of continuing my life's work in the new Nazi Germany. I'm assuming here that you are sufficiently informed that the Nazi party expressed strongly against all the efforts of same-sex love, long before the seizure of power in January of this year. When the elimination of paragraph 175 was proposed in 1929, the Nazi party threatened to hang all the homosexuals and expel all the advocates of the abolition of paragraph 175 from Germany as soon as Hitler came to power. Immediately after Hitler's seizure of power earlier this year, all sorts of strict measures suppressing the homosexual movement were enacted. Originally, these persecutions were directed only against the ugly excesses of the movement. They were limited at that time to the closing of whorehouses that have always harmed the whole movement in the eyes of all decent people. 
there were police actions in the interest of cleanliness and in the interest of the uh, and in the interest of the reputation of the movement were welcomed by us in addition we thought correct the confiscation of writings and books that have actually been only trash or those tabloids that by their unscrupulous sensationalism gave the movement the worst reputation i only remind you of the awful cheesy magazine men for sale by frederick radzwit uh, whose totally mindless rag was just based babble on the stupidest sensibility and literary pretension of the gay populace. The confiscations took on an essentially different character with the destruction of the writings of D Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld. Because Hirschfeld was also a Jew, his persecution was also due to anti-Semitic tendencies and prejudices, and thus homose homosexual Jews view him as a martyr in the mold of the Middle Ages. You know that I have fought Dr. Hirschfeld also, but not because he is a Jew, but because all of his pseudoscientific work stood against our view of the widespread bisexual predisposition of men and narrowed the homosexual inclination in men to a unique feature of the so-called earning effeminate gay minority, a catastrophic danger to our entire movement. His false and ridiculous earning theory degraded the manliest men in world history to half women. Hirschfeld's burning bust and books on the pyre of German students was the first realization of this threat. On the 3rd of May, a week before the bonfire, three detectives, three detectives from Berlin came quite unexpectedly. More than 2,000 nude studies were seized by the officers and taken to Berlin. On September 2nd and 4th, the second and third major confiscation took place in, in my publishers. The first time it was already dark. The uniformed police took about 3,000 copies from the last year of Der Eigene and picked up the second time about 3,000 copies of the Eros. In the fourth confiscation on November 15th, the criminals seized my most important and valuable books. In the fifth confiscation on November 24th, the police confiscated the remaining copies of Der Eigene overlooked in September. I was completely ransacked by these five confiscations, have nothing to sell, and I am now ruined financially. My entire life's work is now ruined, and, my, and most of my followers do not even have the courage to write a letter to me, and certainly not to support my work to provide me money. The loss caused by the many confiscations and prohibitions is about 10,000 marks. This situation shows the very simple fact that a continuation of my work and further publication of my magazine on German soil is no longer possible. Further publication of my magazine, Der Eigene, can only happen in foreign countries where the cons consequently necessary freedom of the press and legal certainty persists. End letter. First, they came for the sleazy tabloids. An attack on gays is an attack on Grero, if not out of principle, then out of self-preservation. Gore Vidal, a quote from Gore Vidal. I was about 23 at the time and prone to theorizing. Also, I said very vaingloriously that it is possible to make any man. I may not be the person who can do it, but someone can make him. Dr. Kinsey agreed. End quote. More than anyone else in the modern era, Gore Vidal has cut through the bullshit of the hetero-homo dichotomy. Pointing to the Romans, Vidal recognized that culture, rather than biology, dictates our sexual norms regarding same-sex attraction. Quote, Of all tribes significantly, the Jews alone were consistently opposed not only to homosexuality, but to any acknowledgement of the male as an erotic figure. But in the great world of pre-Christian cities, it never occurred to anyone that a homosexual act was less natural than a heterosexual one. It was simply a matter of taste. From Archilochus to Apuleius, this acceptance of the way people actually are is implicit in what the writers wrote. Svetunius records that of his twelve emperors, eleven went with equal ease from boys to girls and back again without Svetunius ever finding anything remarkable in their polymorphous perverse behavior. Since these twelve men were pretty tough cookies, rigor rigorously trained as warriors, perhaps their sexual categories and stereotypes, can it really be false? End quote. If all but one masculine emperors liked other men, same-sex sex is not the hallmark of the stereotyped small minority, concludes again Vidal. Quote, Dector is in full cry. Fags are really imitations of women. Dector persists in thinking that same-sexers are effeminate, swishy, girlish. It is true that a small percentage of homosexualists are indeed effeminate, just as there are effeminate heterosexualists. I don't know why this is so. No one knows why. End quote. 
But we do know from a previous chapter that gay is an effeminate gender minority. Such a curious species does in fact exist. I also have not met any significant number of effeminate men who style themselves as heterosexual. There may have been an odd exception here and there, but nothing like the proportion of effeminate gay men in a gay bar. Vidal's conflation of feminine and masculine homosexualists is mooted, though, by his rejection of the label homosexual. Quote, Actually, there is no such thing as a homosexual person any more than there is such a thing as a heterosexual person. The words are adjectives describing sexual acts, not people. The sexual acts are entirely natural. If they were not, no one would perform them. I have often thought that the that reason no one has yet been able to come up with a good word to describe the homosexualist, sometimes known as gay, fag, queer, etc., is because he does not exist. Gay is just a bad word. You see, I don't think you need a word for it. This is what you have to evolve. These words have to wither away in a true Hegelian cycle." End quote. But his formulation that there are no homosexuals, only homosexual acts, does not go far enough. A more precise variations, there are no homosexuals, no homosexual acts, and no homosexuality per the conflation through procreation discussed previously. However, ridding ourselves, entire, ridding ourselves entirely of a bad label does not obligate us to be rid of all labels, notwithstanding Vidal's skepticism about them. In fact, we know that gay, we know that the gays, despite Vidal's advice, have continued to assert their separateness by using their label with much pride. And while I am very happy, or shall I say gay, to see them flourish, their rise on the national stage and subsequent subsumation of the entire homosexual category has been disastrous for masculine men who like other men, just like in Adolf, Br Adolf Brand's times. There is a correlation between the rise of the effeminate gay minority and the decrease of masculine men having sex with others like them. The more visible the effeminate gays became, the less likely masculine men would want to mess around with each other, lest they be thought of as effeminate queens. Quote, between World War I and World War II, straight guys could have sex with other guys and still be perceived as straight as long as they acted masculine. Whether you were considered a fairy or a queer back then wasn't based on sexual acts so much as outward behavior." End quote. Gore Vidal's near-miss flyby is even more maddening since he himself provides evidence that effeminate gay man's prominence has restricted the number of masculine men wishing to associate with same-sex sex. Quote, I have noticed a very interesting change in my own lifetime, and that has been the fact that the quality of trade has fallen off. When I was young, there was a floating population of hetero males who wanted money or kicks or what have you and would sell their ass for a, for a period of their lives. Later, they would marry and end up as construction workers or firemen or in the police department. And that was that. Their phase was over. But these were really all American types, masculine in the old sense. There has emerged a new physical type who seemed feminine to me, and I use that and I use the term in its old sexist sense. Very schmoo, soft shoulders, flat muscles, broad hips, high voices. End quote. Another author, Pierre J. Uh, J. Tremblay, recounts that during his adolescence he witnessed and participated in more same sex acts that would be in more same-sex acts than would be the norm in later decades. Quote, In 1960, I was 10 years old and growing up in a working-class environment where male homosexuality was the rule, not the exception. Its predominant manifestation was the sex with equality, thus including mutual masturbation and oral sex, but not anal sex. The latter uh, was not even thought about, except for eventually learning that passive anal sex was an activity engaged in apparently degraded males who thought themselves to be like women, or were labeled as such because they were accepting the status of being anally penetrated. As for ourselves living in a world where effeminate males did not exist, our sexual activities with other males gener generally reflected our social relationships, most sex with one's best friend, and lesser sex with lesser friends. We also had girlfriends 
friends and knew what was to be done sexually with them as, as it was so well understood via having learned the word fuck and its clear meaning. This explains why even the thought of fucking one's best friend was precluded. The activity or related desires was in violation of our equality-based ma male bonding friendships. Sexual activity was also only a small part of our daily activities, and, and it was not an everyday activity, although at times it was enjoyed more than once a day." End quote. So Gore Vidal was complaining about the lack of masculine prostitutes in 1974, but as late as 1960, we still have first-hand experience of the predominance of same-sex sexuality among typical non-gay youth. What happened in the intervening few years? The effeminate gays became visible. The Stonewall Riots were in 1969, the first time gays massively revolted against state-enforced discrimination against them. While the late 60s provided an increasing number of gays on TV, the dams burst after Stonewall. While there were a dozen gay-themed TV shows in the, first, in the five years before Stonewall, there were almost three times as many in the five years after. Before gay prominence on television, homosexuality was just, was just an amorphous evil, but without the effeminacy stigma. It was, it, was, it was strongly discouraged, if talked about at all, but just like drinking and smoking, boys will be boys. This also explains why Kinsey's same-sex numbers from the 1940s reached well into the double digits while they barely 5% of the male population admits to same-sex sex. Kinsey was not cooking the books. The repressive 1940s were actually more free because there was less open talk of the evil monster and no association with effeminacy. Same-sex sex was such a taboo, it wasn't. All that changed when the out and proud gays showed up with their feather boas and assless chaps. Tremblay, on his later experiences with the gay community, around the same time Gore Vidal noticed an uptick in effeminate prostitutes. Quote, When I ventured in the gay communities in 1978, a major new experience involved the learning about the so-called gay-identified males, many still being teenagers, and they often were gender nonconformable. As a rule, they had also grown up thinking themselves to be the only ones with homosex desires in their neighborhoods, their schools, or even their town or city. Their feelings of isolation had been extreme, resulting in their belief that male homosexuality was exceptionally rare, and many had grown up perceiving themselves to be freaks." End quote. And the culture through the media gladly played along to this gay cluelessness as a way of discouraging same-sex behavior among the masculine. Of course, there is nothing wrong with the feather boas or assless chaps, but it's still improper to compliment ladies on their mustaches. What about those of us who are not into that stuff? How can we be part of a group that is both effeminate and claims minority status when we are masculine and numbered 90% in better days? Without labels, we have disappeared even more than before. Hence the need for a label. Gays have theirs, we want ours. Guerrero allows masculine love without shame. As the Greeks said, open love is better than secret love. But without a word to describe a concept that is mutually understandable, that open love cannot exist. The love that dare not even know its own name is one that remains inexpressible. We are animals barking at our own reflections at a longing that cannot be realized, at innate desires that quietly bubble up and sometimes explode. This is what makes homophobes want to herd gay men. Even if we realize what we are, we are mutes in a land where no one speaks our language anyways. Without a name, we are ghosts rematerializing only temporarily as the punching bags for moral panics. However, Gore Vidal's greatest error was not his failure to recognize gays as effeminate and separate, nor his rejection of necessary rape labels. Gore Vidal was a fatalist. What does his novel The City and the Pillar refer to? The story of Lot and his wife fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah. The wife looks back with fondness and turns into a pillar of salt. Don't look back on the past, move on. Gore Vidal realized at a young age that he, would, that he would never find a love like Jimmy Trimble. But why not? Are a thousand brief anonymous adhesions any better? Nostalgia is counterproductive, but without Grero as a theory, proto Grero feelings rear their heads only temporarily in a few crevices, a quick relationship behind everyone's back, or a thousand anonymous blowjobs. In the novel, why does Bob reject Jim's advances? Culture. 
the culture that destroyed an open sexual ethic can itself be destroyed, but not without the Guerrero label or Guerrero theory. Culture may only be destroyed by a solid theory which necessitates labels. Postscript. Gore Vidal is dead. Virtually every obit mentioned him as a gay author, and yet, quote, I have never allowed actively in my life the word gay to pass my lips. I don't know why I hate that word. It is not definitive of character. And that was the movement of the post-Stonewall folks. This was a new race that had been dropped down by heaven to make the world a better place. Pure nonsense. End quote. So much for that. An online gossip rag makes the wild claim that City and the Pillar featured, quote, overtly gay characters, end quote. The New York Times misunderstood it as a coming out story. No! Gore Vidal's whole point was that Jim and jo uh, that Bob and Jim were two normal all-American boys of the sort that I had spent three years with in the wartime army who would challenge every superstition about sex in my native land, end quote. They were explicitly not gay, but two young men who escaped the gravitational pull of the passively acquired cultural trait called heteronormativity. Too bad the difference is lost in today's homosexual conflation. By not formulating a label in theory, Gore Vidal shows, shows us that if you don't have a name, people will make one up for you, even one that you have actively rejected for decades. But Vidal probably did not, did not care, thinking himself, thinking himself as a Roman emperor without need for labels. If society were to move towards more towards the kind of what I think uh, you're at, the attitude you've, you've expressed here as not putting so much importance on um, one's gender identity and sexual identity, um, what implications... What do you think Julius Caesar would have asked? My lord, what is your sexual uh, preference or your sexual... Uh, designs and strategies. What is it, Caesar? Mm -hmm. you know, send you off to have your head chopped off. Androphilia. Before my foray into the gay world, my understanding of the gay was based solely on effeminate types I saw in the media. So how could it be universally true if I had not met many gays? It's just stereotypes I wanted to believe. Desperate to find others like me, I put aside my skepticism and plunged into the gay world. After a relationship left me thinking about why the gay world had none others like me, I found the book Androphilia. With the subtitle, Rejecting the Gay Identity, Reclaiming Masculinity, and a pair of Spartan helmets on the cover, I had high hopes. Maybe there were others like me after all. The author, Jack Malbranche, promises a manifesto for, quote, Men who love men, but who are sick to death of the gay community, end quote. Androphilia is an attempt to, quote, reclaim this rich male heritage for men who love men. It dismisses those who want to confine homosexual males to a cliched, effeminate stereotype and suggests a different way to perceive a homosexual desire and encourages homosexual and bisexual men to thrive unhindered by the limitations of the gay identity, end quote. Further, quote, Gay stands for the notion that sexuality engenders ethnicity and complete social identity. I have virtually nothing in common with most members of the gay community that includes lesbians, queens, transsexuals of all religions, nationalities, and races. They are not my family. They are not my people. Why should I identify more closely with a lesbian folk singer than with other men my age who share my interests? I strongly identify as a man. I value masculine qualities in myself and in the men around me. In my adult life, I found that I am most comfortable among other men, regardless of their sexual proclivities. Gay culture embraces and promotes effeminacy. The phrase gay man implies effeminacy. As a deterrent, opponents of homosexuality have attributed a stigma of innate femininity to all men who engage in sex acts with other men. All is good so far. Uh, end quote. All is good so far. However, trouble in paradise. Quote, the insistence by essentialist gay activists, by gay advocates, that homosexuality is absolutely innate and inflexible, combined with their celebration of effeminacy, has actually fostered the perception of a mutually exclusive relationship between masculinity and same-sex desire. The idea that homosexuality is not a choice, that homosexuals are absolutely born that way, seems always to have been more a matter of faith and of political convenience than of honest or objective analysis." End quote. 
Yes, gay men are wrong to associate all of same sex with only their kind uh, and effeminate, only with their kind and effeminacy. But the problem is the conflation of homosexuality through pro, pro, through pro, procreation, i.e., the concept of homosexuality itself. But gay men are in fact born that way, as shown by the ample material on the gay gender, which needs no repetition here. Instead, Jack ignores the science as inconclusive and continues to assert that gays were made that way by their own gay culture, usually prefaced with dismissive harangues about discrimination that a more masculine Jack certainly never had to face. Quote, You'd never know it from listening to many gays, but most homos today actually are harassed, beaten, or arrested due to their sexuality, and they face minimal, if any, discrimination. Nevertheless, the gay party tells us that we homosexuals must band together to fight against high school bullies and to encourage kids to come out and ghettoize themselves into little gay support groups where they can be become conversant in party dogma and avoid ever having to learn to deal effectively with their straight peers. Homosexual male, males are males who have been robbed of a masculine ideal. Most are lost boys without a sense of what it means to be men. Peter Pans, who never, became, uh, who never become men and leave the never-never land of the gay party life. Homosexual males don't become men because they're never expected to be. be uh, homosexual males don't become men because they're never expected to, because they don't recognize themselves as real men. They regard straight men as men and regard themselves as something else, because they've been stigmatized as being effeminate, they play at being womanlike, but they're simply not female." End quote. With exhortations to, quote, abandon affected gay behaviors, surround yourself with men, and explore male culture, end quote, the confused reader may think he's perusing a pamphlet from an ex-gay ministry, except Preacher Jack accepts same-sex sex as long as both guys like to go fishing every once in a while. Picking on gay men and attracting self feigning effeminate men, feigning masculinity to your movement uh, do not sound like good ideas. Jack thinks that because he was part of gay culture, drag, go-go dancer, and other hijinks for a short while, that for all others it must be a phase too. All the, advantage, all the disadvantages of having a girlfriend with all the societally mandated disadvantages of having a boyfriend. Such a facade crumbles quickly though, as neither Jack nor I bought it for much time, if any at all. I doubt that either of us had to make a concerted effort to pull away from a culture that we felt was not us. But what about the wh but what about biological men for whom prancing about and faggotry do feel natural? Jack's empathy levels don't permit that thought. For uh, quote, ice skating is a good sport for women. It's pretty and feminine. Only the male skating is offensive. If I wanted to see some fucking queen in a spandex gyrate like a fucking whore, I would go to a fucking gay bar. That's what I get from most men. It's embarrassing to watch because the skater is embarrassing himself. It's uncomfortable to watch a man dishonor himself." End quote. While I agree that masculinity is not whatever you want it to be, and that gay men have a mistaken view of masculinity, their nature is not masculine. Whereas Guerrero seeks to be descriptive and describe men and gay men without the cultural noise, Androphilia is decidedly prescriptive and bossy towards gay men. Guerrero says how things would be, Androphilia says how things should be. Even from these few quotes, Jack's criticism of gay culture borders on bullying, especially when compared with straight men who receive, who receive the kid gloves treatment in an essay titled, Why I Treat Straight Men Like Married Men. Quote, while straight men would rather not discuss it because they don't want to be perceived as latent homosexuals, they do regular, regularly admire one another's bodies at the gym or at sporting events. Straight men are not blind. Those who are secure in their sexuality can and do appreciate a good-looking fella. I've even had private frank discussions with straight men who spoke rather reverently about other men's cocks. I don't mean to suggest that this admiration is always sexual. It usually isn't. But admiring masculinity in other males is part of being male. 
Sure, some straight men are more available than others. Some would fumble around with another guy given the right situation and a few adult beverages. Some would go there for the right amount of money and the condition of relative anonymity or under extremely extraordinary circumstances. Some guys would really not cross that line if they were totally plastered off for a million dollars and someone had a gun to their head. Given those choices, most heterosexual men will insist they are in the last category. None of that matters. End quote. None of it. After spotting holes in the dam of heterosexuality, Jack, inves Jack investigates not even a little to gauge male sexual flexibility, but instinctually stifles all debate on the matter. And what a double standard. Whereas he argues in the beginning of the book that gay men merely prefer sex with men, but could have sex with women because sex is sex after all, does he ever inform straight men that, that they choose cock over abstinence? Nope. Straight men and their belief that they are free from the taint of homoeroticism, even when admiring other cocks, must be respected. We have to tiptoe around such emotionally fragile princesses, so hitting on them is as wrong as adultery. What if they like it and then have to ponder the implications? Oh, the horror! I'm a fag like everyone else. Jack's definition of gay as a, quote, whole culture and political movement that promotes anti-male feminism, victim mentality, and leftist politics, end quote, shows more of this dominant bully-submissive slave mentality. The gay men I've talked to are generally apolitical in anything but support for their right to be treated equally. Gay men for gay rights. Shocking. I don't agree with a two-party system, or even any party system, though that'd be another book, but American gay men's rejection of the Republican Party, rather than a positive embracement of any particular ideology, is rather obvious. Why support the people who explicitly hate them? Jack himself is a sort of unaffiliated right-winger who has written for AlternativeRight.com, an online magazine for radical tra traditionalism, and the new independent intellectual right, whatever any of that means. The same magazine published an article by Richard Spencer arguing that so-called homosexuality is in fact an inborn trait but undesirable trait, meriting perhaps correction in the womb. The ethnostate would not merely be an egalitarian state that happens to govern a white population like Finland or the state of Maine, it would be eugenic in the sense of seeking greater human flourishing of the European people, as opposed to the actively dysgenic policies of the contemporary West, which seeks to subsidize and import the dysfunctional, ugly, and unintelligent. A potential ethnostate ethno would view homosexuality as, un as an unfortunate malady for society as well as the homosexuals themselves. Simply letting be would be an option, but rational preventative steps might also be taken to ensure that fetuses undergo normal, properly gendered brain formation, all of which is entirely possible with existing technology and prenatal testing." End quote. It would not be fair to connect Jack with another author just because both have written for the same publication, I Don't Believe in Crime by Irrelevant Association. However, Jack accepted a review from Spencer for his new book, The Way of Men, so the link is deeper. Where is Jack's rage against Spencer's disrespectful characterization of his love for other men as, quote, an unfortunate malady, a birth defect caused by a random abnormality in the womb, end quote. With dozens of pages of analysis of what's wrong with gay culture, some of it spot on, where is the outrage against a man calling you an aberration who should have been fixed? Oh right, your straight betters can disrespect you and you must take it like a man, which in this case is a euphemism for a chump. This sort of pusillanimous uh, masculinity is for men who want to be enslaved, and if that's the goal, why not go the traditional route via marriage? So again, straight men are not to be disrespected by facts like their minority in Roman Greece, or evidence confirming that most homophobes like Spencer harbor same-sex desires. Self-proclaimed straight men have a right to be unencumbered by evidence of their non-existence. Fag, fags have the right, nay duty, to shut their mouths and rid themselves of their feminine airs. After all, could straight men's weak hearts handle the news that they don't really exist? That would make the darlings uncomfortable. Token homosexuals kept for the purpose of, but I have a gay friend, should keep, uh, should keep quiet lest their house faggot privileges be revoked. 
Oftentimes, this androphile masculinity feels as superficial as Junior putting on daddy's suit and tie. Better, though, than wearing mommy's dress, I suppose. With platitudes like self-reliance, achievement, personal responsibility, honor, respect, integrity, and independence littering the pages of the masculine ideal chapter, I'm left wondering whether Jack wants to invent a new fake holiday like Kwanzaa. What about guys who just want to throw a ball around and maybe mess around in the showers afterwards instead of lighting a candle for each virtue in Jack's candelabra? And do women not have these values? Do women strive to be disrespectful and dishonorable? Hint, it's not a distinctive masculine trait if the other sex shares it with men. I tried to talk to Jack on his Androphilia Facebook page when he linked to a rather nasty article about Chaz Bono's sex reassignment surgery, instead of pointing out the unnecessary rudeness in that article, I tried to focus on the facts and find common ground on the innateness of masculinity. If you are listening to the audio version, here I cut out the dialogue since it was too awkward to read out loud. If you are interested in reading it, please visit grero.com, G-R-E-R-O. And with that, I was unceremoniously blocked. The conversation sums up the Jack experience quite well. As with straight men and their flexibility, none of that matters. Screw the evidence, screw the questions. And, th and there was that lack of empathy again. If Chaz will never know what it's like to have been born a real man, how does Jack know what it's like to be Chaz, born biologically female, but who has insisted that she is no more and should have been a he to begin with? Why do Jack's personal feelings about others override their own personal feelings about themselves, especially when the other's personal testimony supports the science? The major flaw of androphilia is a lack of self-awareness. The criticism of culture is absent and self-harming masculinity promoted. Jack interviewed a musician who gave this autobiographical sketch, quote, as a boy growing up in a working-class area of Chicago, there was little tolerance for the weak and fearful. The pecking, order was, the pecking order was fierce. My friends and I spent most of our time playing games like Ringolavio, which was a violent game of tag, essentially. No bars hold. One could punch, kick, and wrestle down, or by whatever means, to capture an opponent. The chase went on over rooftops, jumping from one rooftop to another, two or three stories high. That was just one of the violent games we played. We spent lots of time flipping fright trains, bare-fisted boxing matches, and gang warfare. Such endeavors build up courage and confidence and toughness. I don't think many feminists would have survived playing with us. So we all knew the difference between a girl and a boy. It was axiomatic. Our goal was always adventure to break the boredom. We raised a lot of hell, as they say. But that is what a normal teenager should do, short of serious crime. If young men don't get that out of their system, it may arise later in life and be of a very unsavory nature." End quote. Or rather, if young men get that into their system. This is just rationalizing child abuse, your own abuse. Pecking order? This is just kowtowing to unjustified hierarchy. What's masculine about cowering? This is the fundamental problem with many men. They excuse their abuse at the hands of their parents, siblings, teachers, and peers under the guise of masculine toughness. If science is to be believed, masculinity is systemized thinking. Your nerdy Silicon Valley entrepreneur fits that better than neglected ragamuffins beating the shit out of each other because no one loves them. This perverse inoculation, the beatings made me tougher, is not earning one's masculine stripes, but defensive scar tissue over childhood trauma. I'm reminded of an exchange between Stalin and his mother. Why did you beat me so hard? That's why you turned out so well. Later in life, with his paranoia in full bloom, Stalin gave the following orders to extract confessions from his own doctors. Beat, beat, and beat again. A very unsavory nature may arise indeed. The interviewee uh, subscribes to Asatru, which is an ancestral religion. The links below uh, the links below the short introduction are to ancestry websites where you can find your family tree or start your free family tree. Why are immediate ancestors called parents who allowed their sons to beat others worthy of worship? 
presumably for the same reason that Stalin externalized his childhood trauma onto others, but treated his own mother well and even wrote favorably of his old Siberian prison guard. Jag does not comment about flipping fright trains and other signs of obvious abuse of his interviewee. Quite the opposite, the interviewer bemoans the softness of culture as the price of civilization and physical security. First, there is nothing wrong per se with softness. That we don't wipe our asses with cactus anymore is not a problem. Second, the abuse that is parental neglect through video games is not cured by the abuse that is parental neglect that results in vandalism and brute violence. In Androphilia, Jack Down plays, quote, only routine, only routine harassment, quote, he's experienced by dismissing it as, quote, the kind that any kid who is different experiences in high school, end quote, while he lashes out against gays who manufacture the illusion of oppression and victimization. Downplay and internalize the bad as not a big deal, then externalize the poison onto others by demanding their silence. If others shut up about their pain, I won't be reminded about mine. Stiff upper, stiff upper lip chaps. He assures us, though, that he has a, quote, truly fulfilling relationship with my immediate family, end quote. This macho bullshit is about keeping abusers in power and above criticism. If you reveal the abuse, you're a pussy. There's little tolerance for weakness. Well, guess what? Not only are women told that staying quiet about abuse is ladylike, but the lack of grero is the product of abuse. Threats of death, threats of hell, threats of prison, threats of abandonment of parental love. Man-to-man -man alliance. Quote, the man-to-man -man alliance is a coalition of men who practice fraud, phallus against phallus sex, who reject anal penetration, promiscuity, and effeminacy among men who have sex with men and who put forth the truth that one man should love another through the celebration of their mutual masculinity and the exaltation of their mutual manhood. End quote. The beatific story about Luke and Stephen comes from the man-to-man -man alliance. I remember reading it in high school. It was one of the few pieces of evidence that there were others like me, at least until reading Gore Vidal and Androphilia. However, the overall M2M material leaves much to be desired. The above-quoted self-description of the M2M is incoherent. Not helping much is its presentation in red 100-point font accompanied by gratuitous amounts of nude men on every page. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong with lots of nude men. But was I supposed to show this website to anyone? Hey mom, good news, I'm not looking to get anally penetrated, I just want to rub cocks with half the guys at school. Some man on the internet tells me it's okay. And uh, am I really expected to call myself a cock rub warrior? I understand the need to be frank, and Grero has in no way shied away from that, but the marketing department needs to go back to the drawing board. This idolatry of a specific sex act, no, no matter how wonderful, goes well beyond even the gay identity's fixation on sex. While neither huge headings nor bizarre idiosyncratic syntax were helpful, the M2M theory offers not much beyond the many short declarative sentences that dot the material as such. Quote, we don't, we don't encourage men to identify as gay or as straight, but we do encourage men to be open and honest about, about their affectational and sexual interests in other men. To not do that is to encourage two lies. Number one, the, heterosexu the heterosexist lie that real men aren't attracted to real men. Number two, the analist lie that only gay males are attracted to other males and that all of those males do anal and are promiscuous and effeminate. Both heterosexism and analism are lies. Both are byproducts of heterosexualization, and both are lies." End quote. If, we, if we squint, we can see Grero ideas in all of these fleeting thoughts. The heterosexism and analism resemble roughly two central ideas discussed thus far, the role of culture and gay effeminacy. Heterosexism corresponds to the Grero idea that culture is, quote, from the man-to-man uh, -man alliance, a societal tyranny and a product of the forces of heterosexualization, which confuses heterosexuality with masculinity and teaches that real men don't have sex with other men. 
Heterosexualization is the process by which a false masculinity is imposed upon masculine identified men, a pseudo-masculinity which forces them into the, into the denial of same-sex feelings and an exclusively heterosexual expression of sexuality. Heterosexualization is most widespread in the industrialized and post-industrialized West, the US, UK, EU, Canada, and Australia, and is accomplished through the destruction of all male spaces, the forced mixing of the sex is particularly in adolescence and the identifying of masculinity with exclusive heterosexuality. In reality, it is both normal and natural for masculine identified men to have sex with other masculine identified men. End quote. Unfortunately, the idea is not fleshed out orderly or in great detail. On the other hand, the author confuses many different concepts about, about effeminate gay men under analism. Quote, Gay identified men today live under a dominant culture of anal penetration. That culture is defined by three behaviors. Number one, anal penetration. Anal penetration is regarded as the necessary and culminating act of any sexual encounter and the highest sexual expression of love, lust, and intimacy between men. Men who do not participate in anal part, uh, penetration are considered psychologically and sexually immature and are otherwise belittled while their sexual choices are denigrated. Number two, promiscuity. Promiscuity, called by its academic pr uh, proponents multi-partnering and or poly-partnering, is also a core value of the culture. Men who aren't promiscuous are chided for missing out on life's principal pleasures, while those who don't participate in sexual experimentation are viewed as timid and their sexual taste characterized as vanilla. Number three, effeminacy. While on the surface the cult would appear to be at least ambivalent about this behavior, in reality effeminacy is supported and rewarded. That's because the prevailing ideology within the culture views all human beings as being intergendered and encourages men to get in touch with their feminine side. End quote. As with androphilia, M2M treats effeminacy both as negative and a choice. One can easily see where the anger against anal sex come from, comes from. The author of the Man to Man Alliance, Bill Weintraub, lost his lover to AIDS, but personal biases should not detract from pre presentability or coherence. As M2M did not fully dissect culture, it's a broken knife stabbing wildly in the dark at the wrong enemy. Goys.org For men who love masculinity but don't identify with the term gay. That is their self-description. Goys are masculine men who like other masculine men but are not gay, hence the zero instead of the A. The identification of gay with effeminate is correct, but the anti-label screams of doth protest too much. A proper identity cannot arise around not being something. As with androphilia and M2M alliance, the anti-gay stance comes across as Sisyphean bullying, seeking to cure the incurable, paradoxically attracting self-hating gays who tone down their own effeminacy. Some good points are to be found for sure, but apart, but apart from Kinsey's old numbers, the material is light on facts, evidence, and theory.